My name is Marsha Foster Boyd, and I'm the proud interim president of Chicago Theological Seminary. It's my joy and my pleasure this evening to welcome one and all to this historic evening as we celebrate the Andre Lecoq Lecture. Uh, we, you'll hear all about that as our different participants share, but it's just my wonderful pleasure tonight to welcome each and every one of you to this lovely evening that we have planned. Please sit back and enjoy. Welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is He Song Huang. I'm teaching here at CTS as a visiting assistant professor of Christian education and uh, public ministry. And what a joy and honor to see you all in this wonderful event and share some words to center our hearts and minds to this very moment. So for this evening, I would like to share a poem called, uh, called Life's Design. It is written by Faris Khan, an inspiring writer and professor in education in Pakistan. So here it is, and feel free to close your eyes or stay open and tuned in. Life's design. We are all weavers of the tapestry of our life, weaving our life's pattern from our allotted places at the loom. Others alongside us also weave their life patterns intertwine with ours because they share our lives. While we feel that we design and control our life, our life pattern that emerges being the collective work of many seldom reflects our own desires. It is only when we disconnect from the frame of our immediate attention so take a long step back and consider the entire vista. When the motive of the grand design of our collective lives will reveal itself. All oh, the grandeur of our composite existence. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Craig Moson, and I was a student of Dr. Andre Lecoq starting in the fall of 1983. I give thanks to his family, Michelle, Pierre Emmanuel, and Elizabeth for sharing Andre Lecoq with us. Truth be told, I was beginning to think that I had made the wrong decision in leaving my law firm job and to attend Chicago Theological Seminary. I was a second career student after practicing law for five years. Maybe I should have kept working at the law firm. I then met Andre Lecoq. His class on the Hebrew Bible rebutted every doubt in my mind. His class more than filled all my expectations and, and more. A common cliche of first year seminary classes holds that classes on the Bible let the scales fall off our innocent eyes, perhaps, and we see the word in a new way. Andre, Andre did not just kindly remove those scales, hmm. but he inspired us, he taught us, he provoked us, and encouraged us to enter into a new dialogue on the Bible that lets us see that dialogue in a completely different way than we brought with ourselves to seminary. He encouraged us to enter that dialogue with the text, with our classmates, with him, and the divine. He invited us to be part of that centuries-old conversation with how Israel struggled to talk with God. He added that Israel could be any one of us if we responsibly undertook the struggle and the dialogue. Class did not end at the top of the hour. Rather, we'd be sitting on the back steps of the seminary arguing over what he had just taught us, or might walk over to the Reynolds Club for lunch and continue the discussion for the whole lunch period. 
it was all not work either. His accent made it a challenge. And uh, what did he mean? Uh, for a while, we tried to figure out what Jean meant. Was Andre trying to bring the Gospel of John into the Prime Testament? Or was he talking about a genre? Either answer could lead to all kinds of new discoveries, but we soon found out what he was trying to teach us. He was such a good teacher at all times. A group of us bought tickets to see Handel's Messiah at Rockefeller Chapel and won ad that advent that first year. Uh, we had a little reception at McGifford afterwards, and we'd hardly started the reception when all the students, spouses, partners, were huddled around Andre asking that question, what did Handel get right? And where did he use poetic license? And most important, where that poetic license may have had terrible consequences in subsequent interpretations of the book of Isaiah. Andre wrote one of the two letters of recommendation for me when I applied for a Jonathan Daniels Memorial Fellowship from the Episcopal Divinity School of Boston to start the Midwest Immigrant Rights Center. He took a chance with me after just one class in that one fall quarter, but he wrote such a generous and kind letter, I received the fellowship, which enabled me to start the Midwest Immigrant Rights Center. We recruited volunteer attorneys to re represent Salvadorans fleeing persecution and violence in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. The center continues today as a national immigrant rights center. I was also becoming an advocate for refugee rights Andre and his wife Claire's inspirational work during and after World War II made him a willing partner in my career as a refugee rights advocate and now a teacher. I would often email him and or meet him for lunch with questions on how the Bible instructs us to welcome a stranger. How can I translate that language into a modern idiom that would work in our advocacy? I was quite honored when Dow Edgerton asked me to write a chapter in the CTS Festrif for Andre, the honeycomb of the word. What a delight to review all my class notes, to review my notes from the books I read that he had authored. Indeed, if I recall correctly, that chapter was the first publication I had as a law school teacher. Finally, I give thanks for the many times when my wife Chris and I would meet Andre or Andre and Claire for lunch or dinner at their home. I would also ask him about a paragraph in one of his books that I, I didn't understand. He would get that twinkle in his eye and start to explain with such great enthusiasm and kindness, like ask the questions. That's what the dialogue's all about. And we would exchange ideas about what each of us was writing about. He would offer very helpful suggestions, new ideas or different approaches. In fact, one of his last emails to me was, okay, Craig, it's time for you to branch out and go into some other areas besides just welcoming the refugee. I'm still trying to figure that one out, Andre. But he spoke with such excitement about a new scholar he was reading or the joy of exploring his new book on Genesis, work and creativity. When Chris and I were deciding on names for our children, we consulted with Andre about the Hebrew meaning of names. In one of our birth announcements, we quoted Andre, for he captured with elegance the spirit of we, what we hope for our child and what we hope for the world. He was so kind and generous. Although his family suffered in World War II, he remained kind and thoughtful to the very last day. I will miss him greatly. I do miss him greatly. I have had a new generation of CTS students Thank me for introducing them to the writings of Andre Lecoque. We've all been blessed with one who taught, deepened my faith, and encouraged us to struggle against all those who would use the word of God to demean or destroy. Andre Lecoque, presente.
Dr. So, were you going to share some words as well? Yes, uh, I'm so sorry, I, I had some uh, came in, uh, joined uh, late. Uh, and uh, it's a, you know, uh, it's a rare uh, honor, you know, to get a, a chance to uh, pay tribute uh, to, uh, you know, in a public manner uh, to one's uh, you know, teacher. So I am uh, grateful for this uh, opportunity uh, to take uh, just uh, just a few minutes uh, to speak to you about uh, Professor Angre uh, Lacob. Uh, Craig uh, did such a you know splendid job, uh, you know, talking about Andre Lacob uh, from a student's uh, perspective, and I uh, you know, cannot say uh, uh, you know you know about you know how accurate. Uh, you know how uh, empathetic, how uh, you know accurate uh, his descriptions were. Uh, so I, you know, I am not going to talk about Andre Lacoque, the, the prolific uh, author, you know, who you know kept expanding uh, the horizon of his scholarship until the very end of his life. Uh, uh, nor he, his work as a, uh, his leg nor you know his legacy as a pioneer in the you know Jewish Christian studies. Uh, and uh, you know, all those are poor people who are better equipped uh, than uh, than I to give witness to. Uh, so I will simply, you know, share you know some of my uh, you know experience of Andre Lacoque uh, and what it's meant for me uh, over the years. I uh, did not know uh, Professor Lacoque until I first enrolled in one of his uh, courses in 1991 or 1992. But I did hear of him, uh, you know, more than once in Hyde Park, you know, as a close friend and colleague of the philosopher Paul Ricoeur, uh, you know, who, uh, in fact, was the main reason why I came to Chicago in, in the first place. Uh, I uh, I still remember my first impression of uh, Andre Lacoq in classroom. Uh, it was the passion and enthusiasm uh, with which he spoke about the Bible. You know, which was something uh, I did not quite experience in my education up to that point. Uh, he was uh, particularly passionate and, and enthusiastic, you know, when he was lecturing about uh, uh, subjects that concern uh, the spirit uh, uh, of uh, justice and spirit of love in, in the Bible. You know, through the next few years, I uh, became uh, his student. Uh, you know, uh, what drew me to him uh, were not just his you know, classroom teachings, you know, which were immense, which was enormous in, in terms of their uh, perspectives and content. But I also shared with him, uh, uh, you know, philosophical ideas uh, that uh, concerning uh, hermeneutics and uh, ideas that came from, uh, you know, Europe uh, recently, uh, and. Uh, the fact that he spoke with an accent uh, made uh, always made me feel uh, made me feel uh, at ease. Uh, uh, and uh, you know what he was as a as a teacher, uh, it's uh, you know it his teaching left you know really indelible uh, mark on so many uh, of uh, students in my generation and certainly including uh, you know myself. Uh, the the kind of person that uh, he was. Uh, I believe came through most visibly uh, in his uh, relationship with uh, international students uh, during that time. He and his wife, Claire, uh, often invited international students uh, for an evening of uh, good food and conversations in which he would usually listen uh, patiently and in great uh, admiration and uh, kindness. In such occasions, uh, Mrs. Lacoult would always prepare you know, one or two types of rice, thinking that uh, the Asian students would miss their home cooked rice. Uh, this, uh, in addition to the wonderfully uh, delicious food uh, she had uh, cooked. And uh, Andre Lacoult didn't forget to invite uh, some international students to uh, his retirement gathering held in uh, a Hyde Park hotel. Three of his books uh, have been translated into Korean language. Uh, 
two of them by one of his students at uh, CTS. And really, I can go on and on uh, with stories about how he extended uh, his kindness and uh, hospitality and goodwill uh, to you know, those who were more vulnerable uh, in the community and those who were in particular need uh, uh, in the community. I was one of the students who studied with him in the last uh, several years of his long teaching career at CTS. I remember sitting in, uh, in uh, at least one uh, semester uh, uh, that he and Rabbi Sharman uh, taught together. Uh, and I particularly thought even back then as in how those moments were you know, really precious moments, uh, you know, being in the presence of you know, two people of immense uh, wisdom. I was there when he announced his retirement uh, to the CTS community. And when he taught his last class at CTS, Dao Edgerton uh, led a group of students with his guitar and waited outside uh, the classroom uh, and sang, uh, for he saw jolly good piano uh, at the last class, as the last class ended. I was uh, in many of his you know, classes during my MD and uh, PhD in you know, coursework years. I received my worst grade at CTS in one of his uh, courses. In uh, minor, in in the final paper in one of uh, one of the courses on Anders Nygren, I went off on a wrong tangent, uh, you know, making me uh, misread the, the basic premise of his book. I got banned errors. And I certainly received many uh, encouragements over the years uh, from him, uh, probably a lot more than I had ever deserved. Uh, one of the things I still remember fondly was when we talked about uh, how I should go to France and meet the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas in person. The plan did not uh, work out because of my own schedule and because Levinas uh, you know, died uh, not too long after. I, I remember uh, you know, my teacher, Angela Lacoque, not just as a brilliant, prolific scholar of the Hebrew Bible, uh, but really as a personable uh, teacher uh, who embodied uh, the, the Levinasian spirit of ethics, the ethics uh, that allows one to say to the next person after you. And I will always miss uh, Professor Lacoque, uh, my teacher and my uh, friend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So. I'm R Rabbi Dr. Rachel Mikva. I'm the interim Dean and Vice President for Academic Affairs. Uh, I also happen to be the Herman Schulman Chair in Jewish Studies and the Senior Faculty Fellow for our Interreligious Institute. I know that you have come to hear Dr. Laura Limonique and her brilliant address, and we promise we're getting to it very soon. But in addition to the, the ways in which Dr. Lecoq, uh, after whom this lecture is named, and this is the inaugural lecture uh, in his honor, um, in addition to the ways that he's inspired students and, and was a wonderful colleague and a wonderful scholar, he's also really the inspiration for our ongoing interreligious work. And there are so many exciting developments in our interreligious and intersectional work. We want to share just one particular piece of good news. I am thrilled that Dr. Kamila Mumin Rashad will be joining our faculty full time in the next academic year as visiting assistant professor in psychology and Muslim studies. Dr. Rashad has been teaching courses in the Bayan and CTS lineups and students regularly report that they are transformational. She's been a phenomenal partner with our interreligious work at the Parliament of the World's Religions, a NetView conference and other projects. She was the amazing host for our second podcast season of our seven neighbors. And she's the project director for our innovative interactive learning project, Aspire, guiding interreligious anti-racism work as spiritual practice, which is hopefully launching this fall. So with support from the Warish Family Foundation and other generous donors, 
we're, we've already been working her full time, but we are so excited to welcome her to our core faculty. Dr. Rashad, can you say hello and offer just a couple brief reflections with us? Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Peace. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful um, that we started with a reflection, um, really talking about life's design. Um, and that really stuck with me and resonated so much. Um, there's a verse in the Quran that, you know, I turn to um, often um, in which God says, surely with every difficulty, there is ease. And that prompted me to think about in March of 2020, um, the pandemic um, COVID was declared. And then March of 2021, um, just three short days after the sudden death of my eldest brother, I received an email from Dr. Mikva inviting me to partner CTS. Um, and at the time I was stunned, but also very, um, flattered and I had to turn to a best friend and I said, I'm, I don't know what I should do with this invitation. It's actually one that I had been praying for, that I had planned to explore possibilities, um, you know, outside of Philadelphia, outside of sort of the world that I had been in. And here this, you know, very unexpected email lands in my inbox. Um, and I said, yes. <laughs> Um, I said, you know, these, this is what I had been praying for. And I expressed that in our first call um, with Dr. Mikva. And so March of 2022, um, just one year later, you know, in this past year, I've had the pleasure of working with colleagues who are extraordinary, are curious and humble and funny and deeply committed to faith inspired work. And I soon realized that CTS was the academic home that I didn't know I was looking for. Um, and so I hope and pray that my time here, my presence contributes to the CTS community and is meaningful, is timely, is resonant, and it certainly is the highlight of my career um, to begin full-time as the visiting assistant professor in psychology and Muslim studies. So I thank you, and with deep gratitude, I am ecstatic to begin. Thank you. This evening, I have the privilege of introducing our guest lecturer. Uh, Dr. Laura Limonit is the uh, Associate Professor of Sociology at the College of Old Westbury in the State University of New York. Her research interests include contemporary immigration in the US the and the integration trajectories of ethnic and ethno-religious groups. She conducts both qualitative and quantitative research on Latinx immig immigrants in the United States spanning issues of race, ethnicity, and religion. Her recent book, who, uh, which uh, it's the title I love, Kugel and Frijoles, uh, Latino Jews in the United States, explores uh, issues of ethnicity, race, class, and religious community building among Latino Jewish immigrants. More recently, her current research examines the rise of the Chabad movement in Latin America as an avenue for uh, Jewish identity construction and communal life among Jews in Latin America and abroad. Her uh, uh, groundbreaking scholarship has been supported by the Berman Foundation, the Association of Jewish Studies, and the Templeton Trust. Dr. Limonique uh, earned uh, her PhD in sociology from the CUNY Graduate Center, in addition to degrees from Brandeis University and Columbia University. In addition to her academic interest in research, Dr. Limonique is, has extensive background in public policy, research, and advocacy. Before I turn the mic over, if you will. I wanna share a quick kind of story. Uh, a few semesters back, I, I offered my inaugural course, Latinx Studies and Religion. And as faculty know, we have to turn those books in early because our library staff has to get on to make sure we have it either digital or a copy that we can keep in the library. And um, I had turned in my books. And in fact, I think I even started the semester and started teaching. And in preparation for one of my courses, I ran across Dr. Lee Monique's book. 
And uh, I waved my fist up to God and uh, was so upset that I didn't include this book in that inaugural course. And as I kept thumbing, thumbing through the uh, pages, my um, anger and uh, regret grew deeper and deeper. Uh, it is a fabulous book and is a groundbreaking book. And so it really is an honor for us to have her here today. So please join me in giving an exciting, warm and expectant CTS welcome to La Doctora Laura Limonique. Um, I'm just making sure I'm unmuted. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, I, it, it, is, it is an honor and a privilege to, to be with all of you tonight. So I am grateful for this opportunity and, um, and also grateful to share what I hope is something a little bit different um, that I hope will spur some discussion um, and, uh, and prove some fodder for, for thought. Um, so again, thank you for, for really this wonderful privilege. I'm gonna share my screen and share a, a presentation that I put together. So let's go here. Um, and yes, can everyone see? Great. Um, so I'm just gonna start off a little bit, just um, talking a little bit about why. What's, why is this topic interesting? How I started researching this topic? Um, and how sometimes some questions lead to bigger questions and bigger ideas about the sort of large social forces in the world, which is as sociologists and social scientists and really as, 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 as people we hope to, to understand. Um, so I, um, I'm originally, I'm an immigrant from Argentina. And I, growing up, I grew up in a suburb of Boston with a large Jewish population. And people would say to me, what, you're Jewish? Aren't you Latina? Um, and then sort of later when I got to college, I lived on, on, on the Lower East Side in New York City for many years and they'd go, how could a guarita or a white girl like you speak Spanish so well? And this third quote is from, from a, a respondent who went to a synagogue in Atlanta and they said to him, oh, you're from Venezuela, you're converting, they said, that's so nice. Um, and I remember thinking, sort of growing up and then later on through life, like, but there are Jews everywhere, how do people not know this? Um, and I think there's something we, there's, we think about knowing, um, you know, in the abstract, uh, but when you're faced with this, with with this, with Latinx people, um, for example, or, or Mexicans that are Jewish, particularly for American Jews, whose world is often insular, um, not for everyone, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, there's this sort of, you know, questioning. So. I always struggled with my own identity as an immigrant, as a Jewish woman, as a Latinx woman, as an Argentine. And I started doing preliminary research, really just asking questions, going to events, asking people, how people identify. In what situations are you one, are you more this, or are you more something else? Um, and this sort of led me to the bigger research of thinking about how people construct ethnicity and ethno-religious identity, particularly for immigrants. Um, so questions about how, uh, how people of Jewish descent had similar, or did people have similar experiences? Did, were they able to construct their own ethnicity or ethno-religious identity? Who, who gets to have that choice? And I think that this is an important point. So I wanted to understand how race plays a part in this, right? How, how, uh, how religion is intersects with race, the historical factors that have played out here, sort of what makes Jews Jews today in America? Um, and how does the racial structure of America contribute to that? And how, and why, and how immigrants are so well situated to see that. But I also came to, 
these questions sort of came to, to led me to bigger questions about the process of, of ethnicity and ethno-religious uh, construction in the process of assimilation. How does ethnicity and ethno-religious groups get reconstructed in the process of assimilation? And what does that mean for the immigrants? How do communities get built? So in a nutshell, that's how I started my study. And I hopefully made it, you know, I made some attempt to, to answer these questions um, in ways that I hope sheds light on the bigger questions of ethno-religious construction. Oh, excuse me. So I want to point out that the, 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 which I think is important and sort of think about the theoretical lens with which I'm viewing this. And I understand the experiences of Latinx Jews in the United States. I interviewed 85 immigrants from Colombia, Mexico, Venezuela, Argentina, some from Puerto Rico who are not immigrants per se. Uh, many of them were, uh, uh, were Puerto Rico, were, other, from other Latin American countries that migrated to Puerto Rico and then from Puerto Rico migrated to the United States. Um, the, the majority of immigrants were from Venezuela, Argentina, and Mexico because if they're the largest, uh, Venezuela was at one point a large Jewish community. It is no longer, but they were the largest Jewish communities um, and they're the largest streams of migrations. So the, the story of Latinx, immigrants, Jewish immigrants, is essentially a story of assimilation. And I was really interested in, in understanding, okay, well, we know that immigrants assimilate through socioeconomic advances, through language acquisition, right, they learn English, um, through acculturation, they learn the social norms, behaviors, dresses, but it inevitably involves a change in ethnic ad identity, because what you were in your home country, you were something else here. Um, so what does that mean? for this group of, of immigrants. And I was particularly interested in thinking about ethnic options. Um, so how do immigrants choose or get assigned to an ethnic group? So we know in the United States that the racial constructs are such that not everybody gets to choose. So what does that mean for immigrants and immigrant assimilation um, and immigrant and ethnic construction? And what constraints do they face in the process? of choosing or getting assigned ethnicities. And the third sort of lens with which I thought about this group was, this, was pan ethnicity. So pan ethnicity is really the idea of different groups, nationals, we often think of them as, as, as national groups coming together in one larger group. So we know that in the United States, we often talk about uh, Latinos or Latinx uh, groups. Um, we talk about a larger Muslim group that we assign an ethnic assignation to. We talk about Asian groups. And we know that all of these groups are have some similarities because they're here in the United States together. And, and among Latinx people, they tend to share a language. But there's also many, many differences. So I really wanted to understand, do they really come together and form a pan-ethnic group? And if so, how does that happen? So I just want to um, give a little bit of a historical background of Jewish migration to Latin America. Because Jews and Latin American Jews and uh, Jews in Latin America, in Latin America and here in the United States, see, see and live their Jewishness and their Jewish identity differently than they do in the United States. And in large part, it has to do with where their communities, where their religious, cultural and ethnic communities uh, were constructed within the national structure of the state. So we often don't think in our everyday about how state influences identity. But in this case study, we can see very clearly um, how the context of where groups are found are going to influence their group, their communal as well as individual identity. So this is a, um, a, a photograph here of a, um, 
a Jewish colony called Moisesville, which was founded in 1889. This is not the, this is, we, this is not the, the, these are the majority of Jewish people in Argentina live in Buenos Aires, um, which is the largest city in the capital of, of Argentina. But they first began to come, or, or rather arrived to Argentina in the late 1800s as in agricultural uh, um, communities that were funded by a, a, a very, very wealthy man named uh, uh, Baron Rothschild, um, Baron Hirsch. And Baron Hirsch uh, wanted, wanted the Jews out of Europe and said, okay, well, you know, this, we're going to get the Jews back to the land. And so he's founded these, these colonies. And the reason I show this picture is because what, what happened here is that it, in particularly in Argentina is that Argentines have a, a strong national identity of a gaucho. A gaucho is a cowboy in the wild. So our so the the so we can see here that they're in these traditional gaucho costumes and they very much integrated into the larger national history of Argentina through this experience. This is how they presented themselves as real Argentines. At the same time, they uh, at over time the 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 Jews that, that, that migrated to Latin America migrated for the same reason that the Jews migrated here to the United States. It was really the same, what we call push factors. So essentially the, 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 uh, the economic downturns, the pogroms, the fall of the Ottoman Empire, all of these uh, uh, pushed Jews as well as many other communities out of, of of their home countries and to uh, migrate to, to the United States and to, to Latin America. Argentina was a great place to go. It was a booming economy. Uh, Jews probably preferred to come here, but in 1924, there was a, a, an act called the Johnson Reed Act. And they said, you know what? We don't want any more Jews. We don't want any more Italians. We don't want it. We they really it closed the door to all, to all immigrants. Um, so as a result, Jews went to Latin America. Mexico, Venezuela, the, uh, Venezuela a little bit later, so sort of different streams. But what, what they found there was very different from what the uh, Jewish immigrants found here in the United States. And this is where their identity shifts. So they come to, this, to these countries where there's a strong ci Catholic civil religion where there are always sort of religious and ethnic outsiders because they, they are not Catholic. This is, this is changing over time, but the change is quite recent. At the same time, our uh, Latin America is plagued by political and economic crises where the state is not able to maintain or fund certain social services. So over time, we have the um, you know the education or cultural or or safety or institutions that the state funds, for the most part here in the United States, um, that are public. So as a result, Jewish communities in Latin America form very strong communities and relied on these private ethno-religious institutions to. Um, for these services. They also tend to, given the, demo, the, 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 the demographics of the countries such that, uh, the, or the geography and the demographics of the countries such that Jews tend to be clustered in urban areas. There are fewer suburbs. So they continue to have close communities. When we think about migration streams here in the United States, we, we think about we, we often think about, for example, when, when uh, at the turn of the, think about the, the, um, the Jewish immigrants, the Italian immigrants and the Irish immigrants that migrated to big cities and the close ethnic communities that evolved from this. But over time, they dissipated. Whereas in Latin America, they tended to stay. So as a result, you continue to have strong ethnic communities. At the same time, National culture plays a very important role in how Jews identify. This is a photograph of the Argentine Jewish women's soccer team in front of the Western Wall in Jerusalem. 
and soccer is, you know, uh, our favorite national pastime uh, in Argentina, in Brazil, in many Latin American countries, uh, probably all over the world, but here the United, but but uh, except the United States in many ways. Um, food is another way that uh, we know that 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 people live their ethno-religious identity. And, uh, and Mexicans, for example, have a very strong Jewish Mexican uh, food culture. So this is, uh, this is called, um, it says Kleins, and this, these are kosher tacos. And this is a taqueria in uh, Polanco, which is a very, uh, a, 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 a sort of a rich embedded Jewish neighborhood in Mexico City. So I really wanted to understand what happens when they come to the United States. Well, they, you know, they have strong Jewish. I mean, the majority of Latin American Jews in Latin America have strong Jewish identities, whether they're enmeshed in the community somehow, or because they're often othered um, in their home countries, and they come to the United States. And there's and and in the United States, we find that being Jewish means something else. And when we start to look at the historical structures or factors that created a Jewish identity here in the United States, we can we start we can think about the start we can think way back to the Constitution, pluralism as a norm that's enshrined in our Constitution. At, at the same time, when Jews migrated here, it, the majority of Jews, I mean, Jews have been migrating here or, you know, for, for continue to, to migrate here, but the peak of Jewish migration was at the turn of the century, uh, at, which was the, the largest peak of all immigration that the United States has ever seen. And Jews came at a time where they're at a time of great change here in the United States, right? The, 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 um, uh, they were the, and a great, also a, a, they, they came at a time with where, con, with continue, we see, we continue to see today the strong binary uh, racial divide. So as immigrants, they were not considered white, right? Jews were not considered white. Italians were not considered white. We there's a lot of scholarship, and we can we can sort of unpack this later in the Q and A if, if people are interested. But a lot of scholarship that that shows the ways in which Jews became white over time. And I do want to add a little footnote here because I study Latinx Jews. I also um, and 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 there's a uh, and I also study Jews of color that we need to acknowledge that not all Jews are white and not all Jews identify as white, okay? But Jewish life here in the United States that, that can be traced back to the large wave of migration at the turn of the century was essentially a Jewish migration from Eastern Europe. And the great grandchildren of, of, of these, the grandchildren and great grandchildren of these immigrants today are considered white. Um, the majority of Jews here in the United States are of Ashkenazi or Eastern European de uh, uh, descent. In Latin America, the majority of Jews are also of Eastern European descent, though there are more Jews um, of, of Middle Eastern de descent, um, of North African descent than there are in the United States. So it's about 75, 25 is, is the difference. Um, so back to the United States. It, uh, over time, Jews really, it re really wanted to be seen uh, did not want to be seen as ethnically different. Imagine there's it's 1924. The United States doesn't is is there's a there's an anti-immigrant bias. Um, they've shut the doors. We it's the beginning of, of you know we begin to see a, a, a xenophobia in Europe by the 1920s 1930s. Uh, Jews really push to be seen as as not an ethnic group. And this was a real push from members of the Jewish community 
to be seen as a religious group and not an ethnic group. Um, because ethnicity at that time was tied strongly to race. So what happens? There was the push to be seen as, for Jews to be seen as, as, as a, a, a religious group. At the same time, we see us, there are no more immigrants, right? There's no, so immigrants aren't coming in to sort of replenish that ethnicity. No one's speaking Yiddish anymore. Um, the people are acculturating. There is the, the, the children of this first wave of immigrants are all becoming children of European immigrants and their grandchildren eventually will just become part of the mainstream. So we, and then we have a, a post-war where Jews begin to move out to the suburbs part, with a big help of the, from the GI Bill, which really favored white the, the white european the children of white european immigrants further dividing or sort of furthering for so now we have a, a stronger binary of who gets to be white and who gets to and who doesn't get to be white um in the united states and as a result the only way to be jewish becomes about the synagogue which if we remember back to what's happening in latin america is very different so here, folks are living on Long Island. Their kids are going to the same school. With the, they're down the street. Their neighbors are Irish. They're Italian, and, um, and they go to synagogue for the high holidays. Or they might go to the JCC. But as my respondents would say to me, "Sure, I go to the JCC, but to play basketball." It's not. It's not where Jewish life is necessarily taking place. So. Given this, I said, well, what, what happens, right? Are they, are, what, will they, one would expect, and here I use this, this um, uh, a, a theoretical uh, construction by uh, sociologist Mary Waters and David Middleberg that, that talks about a, this idea of a proximal host, which is really this idea that you come, you may, immigrants are going to be part of a group, once they, they migrate to a new country, they're gonna find the group that best fits them and sort of slot in. But if that doesn't happen, then they construct their own ethnicity. So I said, well, they're Jewish, but you know, they don't practice Jewish, Judaism or Jewishness or Jewish ethnicity, or perhaps they have different levels of religiosity in the same way. Um, or I, will, they, will they be part of the larger Latinx community wherever they are, whatever that might be? Um, or will they form a new uh, uh, ethnicity? And uh, I found that it really depends. So on being Jewish in the United States. So I first wanted to understand when or when or were respondents, when did my respondents feel like they belonged or didn't? And you know, when, how did they navigate their Jewish identity? So uh, this is a, and, a, and I can let you all read it, but, but in a nutshell, um, this is a, a, a Marina is an Argentine Jewish uh, immigrant who lives in Boston. And she said to me, you know, here, um, uh, our whole world can be Jewish if we wanted to. So she, went, she said she went to Jewish schools and then to Ibraica, which is the community center. And she said, you know, and she joined the JCC, but it's not the same. She doesn't feel connected. To, this does not mean that she doesn't go to synagogue. It just means that her Jewish identity perhaps is not as strong. At the same time, Jews in Latin America are used to operating within a closed ethnic community. Um, and they use something that I call ethnic capital. So it's this idea we talk about social, social capital, cultural capital. So it's this idea that people share something and there's some reciprocity of trust that's built along ethnic lines. And sometimes it can be instrumental, but oftentimes this is how people build community, they build trust, they build reciprocity. And, uh, and, and we found, it, what we find is that this happens in immigrant communities everywhere. Um, you're much more likely to trust someone that you see as an insider so oftentimes they try to present themselves as insiders. So um, this woman said to me, you know, uh, I'm not one of those people that takes advantage, but I do use these identities as leverage. 
Um, the Latinos use when I talk to people in the cafeteria, for example. But being Jewish can bring you closer to people. It can open more doors. Um, so I'll just stop for a minute and let you all read that. At the same time, doesn't mean that they don't have a Latinx connection. Um, and these are two of my favorite quotes because I, I, I found them very meaningful. We often think of identity as, as uh, 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 we, 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 we tend to dismiss these small interactions, um, but it's these interactions that makes us feel part of a whole. So um, this, this, uh, this woman is an Argentine professor and she, she lives in, in, in the New York area. And she said, you know, it establishes a kind of intimacy. Oops, I, I, sorry about that. Um, and Amanda said to me, you know, she goes on to say, I have a Latina identity, the language, the way of dancing, the music, the values, the way I see life. And she said, even how I left. And then she goes on to say, even how we die is different, right? Um, so in many ways, it's not just that Jewish uh, institutions are different in the United States. It's that they're the, the respondents are also intrinsically, have intrinsically cultural Latinx, uh, um, um, what they're, it's, it's really what we call, as anthropologists call it, cultural, right? Non-material culture, um, the way of speaking, the language. And then there's material culture. There's books that are shared. There's literature, there's movies, there's soccer. Um, and, and this is oftentimes what's missing in Jewish, American Jewish institutional settings. At the same time, um, I think it's important, and, uh, and many of these respondents talked about um, feeling in it, 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 being a Latin, being a Latino, a Latinx person, a, a white or a Jewish, so therefore seen as white, um, is kind of a costless identity. For many people, right? Um, and uh, Jorge, who's the Mexican, who said, you know, um, I there, there, I have their friendships and their connections are made across social class lines, even if they're not made along ethno-religious lines. Um, Latin America has a very structured class system, and immigrants bring that with them when they're here in the United States. Um, and then Federico said something which a number of the respondents spoke about, and it has to do with affirmative action um, and how the respondents were co very comfortable taking part or privileging from affirmative action as something that is rightfully theirs, often not either not being aware of the the factors that led up to um, affirmative action policies or who are the rights that affirmative action policies are, should are, are, are the wrongs that affirmative action policies uh, should write. So sort of to take a step back, uh, the 85, the 85 uh, uh, respondents for the most part felt sometimes had a stronger Jewish identity, other times had a stronger Latinx identity, often felt that they didn't fully belong in one or the other. In fact, the members who, mo who were least likely to, uh, to have this conflict um, were those with high levels of religiosity. So uh, Latinx Jews who were highly religious in their home country uh, were able to find religious communities here in the United States and feel very connected. So I wanted to know, well, does a Latinx Jewish ethnicity and community emerge? And I found that it depends on three things. So demographics, who's coming, historical timeline, when are they coming? What is where they, what is the, the place that they're landing to, right? They're, they're the, the, what we call the context of arrival. What does it look like? Um, 
what's the what does the community look like? What does the Jewish community look like there? What does the Latinx community look like there? And also location and geography. So really thinking about the physical structures, how did that create community or doesn't create community? So when we think about um, the who, this is, uh, I, I, so I compared two, uh, two, two large uh, contexts of reception where many Latin American Jewish immigrants arrived to. So it's New York City is one and South Florida is the other. And the who in New York City um, it is, the, is, so the demographic who comes to New York City, it tends to be people that are either single or coupled. In fact, families that were part of my study that came to New York City often uh, settled outside of the city in the suburbs rather than settle in the city because it's it's very expensive to have a family in, in, in the city. Um, space is at a premium. So who comes? They often come to study or for work opportunities. So what does that mean? It means that their social network is built in. So if they're coming for university, if they're coming for work opportunities, they already have a social network built in, right? Um, they don't necessarily need Jewish institutions. And in fact, we know that this is the time of life when people are less likely to need religious institutions or ethno-religious institutions. It tends to be, uh, people tend to seek out religious institutions and ethno-religious institutions during, a, during when, oftentimes when they, when they have families, when they're older, but not necessarily when they're single um, or, 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 or couple. So that's sort of the who. Um, and then, so what does New York look like? Well, New York is a Jewish town, even if uh, the, uh, even if Jewish institutions close or the many Jews have moved out to the suburbs, they still sell knishes at every food stand. Everybody knows the word schlep. As one respondent said to me, you know, I don't even have to do anything just by living in New York, I feel Jewish. Um, and it, it, there's a Jewish culture in New York that is not only appealing, but also feels somewhat familiar or it becomes a constructive familiarity. Um, and then we have this idea of physical space, the structure of New York City. So it's New York City, while Manhattan is only 20 square miles, New York City itself is 300 square miles. And people sort of come and live where they can. So they don't, there's no room for interaction. You, um, you, it's unlikely that you will walk down the street and meet someone speaking and somebody will be speaking Spanish or you'll see someone that you knew through a friend of a friend. It, it just doesn't happen in the same way as it might happen in a smaller area. But what I did find was that you, pan-ethnicity occurs with institutional support. So this is called the Jewish Latin Center, and it's a Purim party, um, which is actually happening. I mean, this isn't happening now, but it's Purim now, um, which is a, a, a cost, you know, people dress up in costumes, and this is a Chabad Center. And the Chabad Center, um, many Chabad centers have opened up all over the United States, as well as Latin America, and really all over the world. And many Chabad centers uh, seek to attract immigrants and form community, in large part because they know that this happens. Immigrants come to a city, Jewish immigrants come to a city. They're not necessarily going to go to a synagogue because that's not what they did in their home countries. Synagogues are expensive. Synagogues often don't offer, they don't have, they don't offer much for singles if, who are not highly religious. So the Chabad centers offers much more. And this Chabad center is a place for singles. And they hold events and they have services every Friday night. And after the services, they have these big parties. And what I, I, I so I started attending these events or these, the, uh, these services. And what I found is that over time, we begin to see a sense of panicity. 
And so, so social scientists really uh, measure uh, uh, pan ethnicity and uh, and what we call this this idea of of of, of new ethnic construction um, through one of the measures is through marriage. So this works because this is also a mission of Chabad um, is to uh, is to really couple people up because it's a mitzvah, it's a good deed, it will get us closer to the Messiah. And um, and what happens is that you you absolutely see people from different nationalities partnering and, and getting married. And as a result, you begin to see a sort of new Latinx Jewish culture emerging here in the United States, where the commonalities are their Jewishness, their, their sense of being an immigrant, their, their Latinx identity, they speak Spanish. Even if their nation, uh, national identity and national culture is quite different, the, they congregate around the commonalities and, and create a new group. But this was really the only place that I found this here in, the, in, in New York. However, South Florida is a completely different story. So this is a little city, which is right next to North Miami Beach. And it's in, it's found, it's in Miami Dade County. And it's always, it's always had a big influx of Latinx Jewish immigrants, starting from Peruvians in the 80s, then Colombians, uh, uh, Mexicans in, in 1984, the tequila crisis, um, uh, and, and Argentines. And, and uh, so you have these groups that come, you, you can sort of trace the groups that come see, after you see the political crises that happened in Latin America. And why, so why is it, why is it different? And it's different because number one, who? Who's coming? It tends to be much more likely to be families because the cost of entry is cheaper, right? And by cost of entry, it's not just that it's cheaper to go to Miami. I mean, it's cheaper to fly to Miami. Uh, at, right now, I would say maybe housing is not super affordable, but it was at one point. Miami is a bilingual city, so you don't need to know English. And there's already an existing network. So it's easier to find employment or find work. And there's a lot of transnational business. So really the cost of entry is easier. Um, families sometimes have apartments there. Um, so they're able to go into to, to these apartments that maybe were family apartments. Um, so that's the who. And we know that families need other families in a way that singles perhaps don't necessarily need institutions where they're going to, they, they will meet singles perhaps in other places. Um, but but uh, uh, families are much more likely to want to go to a Jewish institution, to an ethno-religious institution. Uh, at the same time, the historical timeline, what does this look like? Well, Miami is the place where, why, while it was once a sort of hub of Jewish retirees is no longer, right? Um, on the one hand, the, uh, many of the, the Jewish people in Miami um, are passing or, or, or the, the synagogues are dying out. There's, there's really no community to sustain them. And new retirees are sort of going, they're, they're bypassing Miami and going directly up north, um, you know, uh, to, to, to Broward County, to other places. Um, and uh, to, to, uh, so uh, you sort of have these existing institutions that need people. And at the same time, Aventura is a, it's a young city. The schools were not great. They've changed, but they're not great. Uh, they were not great. And parents begin to send their children to Jewish day schools. So they've revived the Jewish day schools, which is very much what was happening in Latin America. They've also revived the JCC and they have a Nebraica arm, which is the sort of Jewish Latino arm of the JCC. And, it's, and what happens in these spaces is that a community, get, a community evolves and is constructed. So people begin to feel part of a larger Latinx Jewish community and identify with, with other people within this, this community. Um, so 
this is a, a temple, you know, right, right in, in, in Aventura, or it's actually in North Miami, but it's right next to Aventura, Aventura and the rabbi's Argentine. Um, the, the, he has services in Spanish and in English. He does a lot of events. And what, he, what, what we found is in many ways, it's what we, it's, it's Latin American Jews are forming new communities, are constructing a new identity. They're also shifting, right? They're doing a little bit of the pushing on how Jewish life is built in Latin America and recreating to some extent um, the kind of Jewish life they had in Latin America. But at the same time, they're assimilating into existing Jewish life because they're attending synagogues. Um, they're much more likely to attend synagogues than they probably ever were in their home countries. And a lot of the, a, a lot of the, of programs and programming um, happens in the synagogue. So, I know, isn't this great, the Jutino? Um, so there's, the, you know, so to, to, to conclude and just to, to leave you all with some, some concluding thoughts, um, just do we really see a, a, a pan after construction? Now I agree that it depends. Right, context matters, um, but but what we do know is that um, there is a there 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 is a reconstruction of ethnicity and ethno-religious identity, and Latinx Jews, when they're in large numbers, are able to to integrate and remake Jewish institutions, uh, but at the same time, it they it particularly in, in large numbers, they are, they are also influenced by the current, how Judaism, Jewishness is practiced here in the United States. What remains to be seen is what happens with their children. Um, we know that particularly in the Miami experience, the Cuban community, Cuban Jewish and non-Jewish non Cuban community was very strong. Um, and uh, in, and uh, I don't think that J Cuban parents foresaw their children leaving Miami, but that's what happened. The difference is that there were no more immigrants from Cuba. That's unlikely to happen um, with the rest of Latin America. We will continue to see immigrants, Jewish immigrants and, and non-Jewish immigrants from Latin America um, to Miami and to other destination areas, to Chicago, to Texas, um, particularly to Houston, to, to, to um, San Diego and, and to New York. Um, and more interestingly, thinking about what, our, what the meaning of Jewishness is in the United States, what the meaning of, of Latino, Latinx is in the United States and how folks can, can be, part of, be a part of those communities and also access them or get, be given entry into them to, um, to continue to acculturate, assimilate, and integrate. And I look forward to discussing more with you and taking your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Limonik. Uh, let me stop you wanna Stop sharing. Yeah, and try, yeah. See each other. Stop sharing. There we go. There we go. There we go. Um, uh, I have lots of thoughts and questions thinking about your research, um, uh, and I'm very appreciative for your sharing what you did with us. Um, one of the things you said early on, oh, before I start, actually, let me just give folks, if you haven't looked at the program, a sense of where we go from here. Um, uh, Munir Sheikh, the, my, my equivalent at our Bayan uh, partner, um, and I will ask some questions or respond to the lecture for 15 minutes-ish. And then we'll open up to other folks who would like to ask questions. If you wanna put your question in the chat, you can do that and we'll do it for you. We'll ask it for you. Or when we get to that point, you can also use the little raise your hand app, not the thumbs up, not the clappy one, but the actual raise your hand. And you'll move your your picture will move up into the upper left corner, and we will see it and be able to ask you, and you can ask your question. Um, uh, but I'm going to start off, and then invite Munir to to offer some thoughts and questions as well. 
So one of the things you said early on was an, you acknowledge that not everybody um, has the option of how to identify, right? That depending on certain characteristics and in America, it's most especially race, um, you get identified for you, right? And you don't get to necessarily choose. So in your, I don't know what the, the ethnic backgrounds um, were in terms of, you know, origin from before Latin America, whether they came from Eastern Europe mm -hmm. or they came from North Africa. I don't know within your 85 folks, how much diversity there was, mm -hmm. but did you notice distinctive patterns amongst people who could not easily sort of disappear ethnically mm -hmm. because they don't yeah. appear white to US sure. eyes? Sure. I think it's a great question. And I think there were a number of um, a number of folks that were of Sephardic um, descent. Um, but one of the things that I think immigrants do um, is clearly delineate themselves. You know, they, they clearly, as much as they can, they clearly try to insert themselves in the sort of correct racial hierarchy or for what they see correct. Correct is probably, uh, you know, the, the one that, that affords the most privilege to them. Um, and uh, I think it would be naive to think that that, 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 that doesn't happen. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes what I notice a lot with, with the respondents um, uh, was this, um, oh no, oh shoot. Um, okay, sorry. Um, what I noticed a lot with the respondents is that they spoke about their accents a lot, right? And this is how they could not sort of escape what they called uh, being being othered, right? Uh, so, so I had a number of stories of um, of people saying, you know, one woman said, you know, I, I, I she's has a small company and she hired someone. She said, you know, I hired someone that speaks English. Uh, without an accent, because they take him much more seriously, and uh, and the first thing that people they they I open my mouth and they say, oh, she's Mexican. Um, so the, I think the accent really was was a big one for them, um, which which is not going to be the case for their their children. Um, but I, and and I think this this often happened in Jewish spaces too, right? Their their accents othered them. And this is, in, in many ways, this, they, it, they, they are assigned a, an ethno-racial identity with this accent. Um, and, the, and that was, you know, that, that, that was, they made, they, that, was very, that was very apparent to them. I mean, there's one story of, of somebody that was in uh, talks with, he was up for a job, and I talk about this in my book, and, and he was up for a job in, in, um, in, for a big Jewish agency. And a part of his job would be to, to, get, to uh, uh, get donations. So somebody said to them, you know, and he had been doing this for many years. And they said, well, you know, what do you think will happen if you call somebody up and, and you have this accent? And, uh, and the, my response said, well, I, I don't know, I, I have an accent, you know? And they said, yeah, but how do you think, you know, the, the potential donor is gonna react? And, uh, and the responsible, I, I, I don't know, right? But it, this sort of like, in, in many ways, it's, it's, they're very much these racist comments that people feel they're, they're able to make um, in large part because, well, I can make this racist comment because you're kind of an insider. Does that make sense? Um. Right, well, we've seen that dynamic operate in multiple ways. Um, it, it, one of its positive manifestations, you know, is that sometimes one kind of, a shared difference, right, will help build a bridge, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so we may uh, be of different races, but we're all Jewish. And so we have some of that capital, that, that reciprocity Absolutely. of trust yep. that you were mm -hmm. talking about, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, but yes, it also lowers barriers of what. <laughs> lowers barriers is a great consider. way to put it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Uh, um, sure. 
I'm very intrigued by this notion of panethnicity, which I mm -hmm. kind of think we invent, right? We, we, we don't Absolutely. want to have to deal with compl complex identities in the United States. We want to other people in groups. <laughs> and so yes. like sure. all Asians, of course, they're all the same. <laughs> right. right. Or yes. everybody yes. from south, from south of Texas, right? Um, mm -hmm. They're all the same. So um, uh, I'm curious if the panethnicity of Latinx identity looked or felt different. I don't know how much what, what you have to compare to non-Jewish Latinx immigration patterns mm -hmm. and experience, but I'm sure you did some of that. So mm -hmm. does the fact of the Jewish piece um, sort of transcend national identities? differently than non-Jews, yes. I'm afraid. Yes, from absolutely. Is it more an internalized panethnicity? Yes. And I think it's that's, absolutely true, right? I think that that's, that's uh, you know, I, I, I think that that um, there's a number of scholars that have studied the, the, the an internal panethnic identity, right? And oftentimes it's one of, right? We see this all over. It's one of many identities. Sometimes you're allowed to but you're also Mexican and it sort of depends. Um, you know, part of what I tried to get up with my research is thinking, is, is trying to get away from this, this construction of panethnicity through um, the, through politicizing, right? Which is where really we begin to see the first push towards panethnicity. And that's, um, it, it happens in the, here in the United States, it happens in the 60s, and later in the 70s, um, and, 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 many, and they started off as grassroots organizations that wanted to sort of harness the power of the vote. Um, and it really happening around the civil rights movement. And, and from that, we start, you know, the, 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 the Latino or the Hispanic rather category doesn't come into effect until the 19, late 1970s and really 1980s when we start to see it under the OMB, the, the Office of Management and Budget Classification of the US Census. Um, so that's really where it, so, so they, it's, from, it's from the top, right? They, they, it comes from the top. But I argue that people then embody this and begin to form that we can't discount culture. I think it's a better way to say it, right? That as Latinx people here in the United States, we have some culture that is created um, because we are from Latin American countries that have been colonized, um, that, uh, it, it, that we, we, most of us speak Spanish um, and most of us share material culture, right? That, that, that uh, many of us, particularly first generation immigrants might watch the same, they, they watch, they, we, we, it's not just language, but it's also, we watch the same TV shows. We listen to the same radio stations. We listen to the same music. We eat the same foods. This is in many ways, when we think about how is ethnicity constructed, these are the pillars that construct ethnicity. So it's constructed, but I would also argue that it's very real. Thank you. Um, I have a zillion other questions, but I want to turn it over to Munir because I'm very curious about how these patterns might also reflect on ethnic and religious immigration experiences within Muslim communities. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Mikva. I'm here at the CTS campus with some of our students. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this program. And I really enjoyed uh, hearing about your research and, and the comments that you made about the particular immigration trajectory of Latinx Jews. Um, obviously, as I was listening, it made me give thought to some of the dynamics in terms of immigration of Muslims to the United States. And I could see and hear a lot of similarities and obviously there are differences. And I wanted to maybe just quickly uh, run through a couple of things I noted about those similarities and differences. And I, I do have a couple of questions for you, which I think are interrelated questions. So hopefully you'll be able to address them, you know, as sort of a, a single response if you like. Um, but, you know, this issue of uh, sort of the generational changes that take place once uh, groups of people do arrive, uh, the initial, you know, strong culture of a particular group, and then uh, children and grandchildren sort of becoming more and more assimilated. I mean, obviously that's a dynamic that we see 
uh, amongst Muslim Americans, regardless of whether they immigrated from, you know, a Middle Eastern country or from South Asia or from, from Europe or from some other places. So I think that dynamic is just something that comes with the territory, so to speak, uh, for people coming to America. Um, I think that, uh, you know, this idea of sort of moving to the suburbs also is part and parcel of that, you know, sort of the aspirational American dream that uh, new immigrants tend to hold. Maybe they get jaded later on, but I think that's, you know, a kind of mythos that operates, uh, uh, you know, in general. Um, and so, you know, that, that desire to, you know, obviously move up uh, socially and economically that's tied to a notion of privilege that's you know, essentially white privilege. So I think we see in the Muslim community, I'm just talking about the immigrant community, obviously the dynamic you know, amongst Muslims is that there's a significant indigenous or African American community so that you know, the dynamics are different. But since we're talking about immigration, I think aspirational whiteness is certainly part and parcel of the story. Uh, maybe there are some parallels to be explored uh, mm -hmm. there um, by researchers. I think both communities obviously uh, are dealing in parallel with anti-Semitism and Islamophobia uh, and the American context, I'm sure, is, is shaping that experience in particular ways that may not be present in Latin America or in other places uh, where there you know, still would be anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, but playing out a bit differently in other societies. I think uh, even as Catholics you know, found their place in America earlier on in the 20th century, uh, you know, Catholic attitudes historically towards Jews and Muslims obviously would, you know, be problematic relatively relative to the post-Vatican II pronouncements about, you know, a more ecumenical stance. Mm -hmm. uh, and then evangelical Protestant Christianity obviously has a significant impact in the American context, um, you know, positive, I mean, detrimental to Muslims in terms of sort of, you know, the, the condition of uh, the American uh, adventures in the Middle East. Uh, and, and how, you know, e Christian nationalism essentially shapes their views of Muslims. So I think that there's mm -hmm. some, some things there that are distinct. Um, in addition to that, you know, people um, convert to Islam in the mm -hmm. United States at, at varying rates uh, from different backgrounds. And uh, perhaps in the Jewish community, you know, that the dynamic is different in terms of how people come to Judaism and embrace it and are embraced as new converts. So uh, that might be a point of dis, uh, distinct disjuncture. Um, and then coming back to this sort of issue of the indigenous Muslims, uh, the African-American Muslims who were already um, exploring forms of Orthodox Islam even before you know, the larger groups of uh, immigrant Muslims came. Although the story of Islam in America tends to privilege that immigrant experience and lens, uh, we know from research uh, being done by scholars of Islam in America that that dynamic is not correctly represented. Uh, however, in, in immigrant Muslims did tend to have an overarching or overriding uh, role or social power to shape uh, perceptions of Islam in America. I think uh, some of what you were sharing in terms of the turn of the century immigration of, of Jews to the United States and establishing communities, that is Judaism and you know, new uh, Jews coming from Latin America or elsewhere might be integrating into that form of Judaism. Um, whereas in the Islamic context, I think the immigrant experience has been more of a, a pronounced uh, dimension culturally, let's say, of, of what Islam is perceived to be. So those are just some remarks and thoughts that I had as I was listening to you. Um, but in terms of my questions, uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, what are the reasons for Latinx Jewish immigration to the United States? In the Muslim context, of course, you know, there were immigrants who had opportunities to come for education. And then subsequently in the 80s, 90s, and all the way until the present time with uh, refugees or special uh, immigrants uh, coming from Afghanistan, you know, we have people who are in dire need of assistance to get acclimated to America, uh, whereas, you know, several decades ago, it was the pursuit of the American dream, perhaps, that was possible mm -hmm. at that time for many immigrants. So I would love to hear more about the reasons for that immigration, because there might not have been a strong economic incentive, or there might have been, I'd love to know. Um, and then I have a question about sort of this notion of the American dream. 
Um, for some Muslims, you know, there is this sense of that, but for other Muslims, it's the American nightmare. And I don't know if that plays out, you know, in the Jewish context. And then lastly, I think, again, a connected question uh, for the Latinx Jews that come to America and become acclimated to America and its socio-political realities, uh, where do they tend to uh, land in terms of the political right or the mm -hmm. political left in America? Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know. And you, you pointed out Florida in one of your maps, so that also triggered that thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was um, that was very, very interesting. So thank you. Uh, and it's something that I've thought a lot about, particularly um, uh, thinking about ethnic capital within the Muslim communities um, and uh, and immigrant communities, and uh, and and also the the idea of of, of pan ethnic pan ethnicity as it relates to to Muslim immigrants. Um, just as we were saying before, what does it mean? Does it is it, it is is it, is it a is it a construct that's valid, right? Um, and I think in many ways um, there are a lot of similarities. And in, in my dreams of dream, where I have a hundred hours to do lots of research projects, um, Latinx Muslims is one of them. But you know, um, so one day. Um, but but so uh, I'm going to start with your last question. Um, and I should have written them down. Um, the political I was just asking about, um, yes. Yes, now the political spectrum, and this is, um, and this is something that's been on my mind a lot lately, in large part, because when I, when I, when I started my research, I would argue that most, uh, most people that I interviewed, um, fell to the center left, um, left of center, um, not, uh, in fact, their political tendencies were not any different from non-Latinx -immig non immigrant Jews of their same social demographic um, uh, uh, categories, right? So um, if I control for age, if I control for, for, for um, you know, uh, where they live, sex, occupation, all those things, they were going to be like most Jews and most Jews vote Democrat. Um, but things have shifted a little bit, and I don't actually have clear numbers. I just know from from r really just from from sort of the beginnings of some research into what happened in Florida and the number of Latinx immigrants that support uh, that support uh, uh, Donald Trump and. In large part, we know that the same, and this happens particularly among Venezuelans, and Venezuelans is one of the largest news groups of Latinx immigrants in South Florida. Um, and it's the same trends that drive Cubans to support. Uh, it's, a, it's an anti-communist, uh, they're, they're voting as anti-communists and therefore um, have really hung on to this rhetoric that anyone but Trump is, you know, too, uh, too far to the left. And, uh, uh, but, but, but it, it seems to be from nascent research to be concentrated, particularly in areas like South Florida. Um, I, I think, again, we have uh, some, uh, the younger younger Latinx Jews are less likely to support uh, Israel policies, um, which then is also going to have some effect on their political views here in the United States. Whereas older, very much like uh, 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 Jewish Americans here in the United States, um, older Latinx Jews are very, very supportive of Israel. Um, in large part, there is a much large, there are much larger ties to Israel um, among Jews living in Latin America. And as you mentioned, I think uh, part of what's shaping the current political system or the, the, the current, current political scene here in the United States is really, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, evangelical Protestants and uh, the rise of their power in, um, in within the Republican Party and their support for Israel um, for many Venezuelans is enough.
um, this would be in Europe. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And you had a first question. You, uh, you, uh, you know, now I, I, now I think I should have, I was listening intently and I did not remember your first question. Refresh, it was just, a, you know, sort of what are the pull factors uh, for immigration? Sure. Let, yeah. So um, uh, the majority have come because of economic crises that then fuel political crises. So oftentimes, and this is, I think, is it becomes very interesting, is that immigrants, particular immigrants whose I, whose self identity is, um, is so reliant on class, are unlikely to tell you that they've come for economic reasons, um, because then they're signaling um, that they have that their social class status has fallen. Right? There's been some sort of downward mobility. Nonetheless, we know from research in general that most migrants come, partic uh, partic and, and, and this is particularly true for, for, for this group, for economic reasons. Um, but it, uh, um, what we do see among Jewish immigrants is that uh, the, the majority of Jewish immigrants that are not from Latin America that have come off, you know, Persian Jews, Iranian Jews, and, uh, and Jews from the former Soviet Union did not necessarily come from um, for economic, I mean, partly for economic reasons, um, but but also for for you know fleeing, fleeing political regimes, but not necessarily for for Latin America. In fact, the 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 nineteen seventies and nineteen the 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 seventies and the and, and even the early eighties, where we have the dictatorships in the sort of southern cone and Brazil, many of many many Jews were targeted. And many left and went to Europe and not necessarily, and Europe was more welcoming than the United States. In fact, the United States was perhaps um, in many ways a sort of, they were like, the, in many ways the shadow dictators at the time, um, arming so many of these dictators. So that, that was, you know. Um, thank you, Munir, for those really thoughtful reflections. Um, and that, now I just want to sit down with you and talk for you, with you for a couple hours about them. Um, but let's turn to questions from folks who are participating with us. Jim, I see your hand up. You can go first. And then Dr. Rashad, I loved what you wrote in the comments. And I'm wondering if you might be able to frame that as a question slash reflection uh, with Dr. Lee Monique. Uh, but Jim, why don't you start us off? Yeah, I was... Um... Thinking back to uh, when I lived in the Twin Cities uh, in Minnesota, in St. Paul, there was a large influx of, uh, of uh, um, uh, Hmong um, refugees. Um, it was a second wave of refugees. These were the people that come from the camps uh, uh, on the various borders. And there was a terrible generational breakdown because you had eight-year-olds who were running the family farm stand um, they were the only ones that understood the money, the only ones that understood the, the language enough to do that. And, and uh, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Limanek, if you saw something anywhere similar to that breakdown uh, between the generations, something beyond the normal uh, immigrant mm -hmm. experience. Um, you know, I think, uh, well, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, and, and, and we, we do see um, those sorts of things in, in other migration streams. But among uh, this particular group of migrants, it's an extremely privileged group of migrants. I, this is not to say that they were all documented because they, they were not, um, but, um, but none of them were refugees. Um, none of them had refugee status. They were, they, so one thing that I should point out is that um, when we think about uh, Jewish migration, um, it's perhaps different in many ways to other streams of migration because there are options. So to come to uh, to come to the United States is costly, and you have to have some sort of capital. But all Jews are able to go to Israel. So uh, folks in Latin America that had, were more severely hit by the various economic crises, went to Israel, migrated to Israel. 
um, because they are, uh, you know, they're, it's, they're, they're actually given not only plain fare, but they're given money to live on in an apartment and they can settle. Uh, 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 so, so we don't see that kind. I mean, that, that's really the real reason why it's such a privileged group um, of migrants. Dr. Rashad? Are you still with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, thank you, Dr. Lemonick. Um, this research really um, appeals to me. I was sort of frantically texting folks um, some gems from your talk. Um, and so I wondered, you know, my, my work focuses on specifically Black Muslim psychology, um, thinking about, you know, identity formation in response to this desire for Black Americans for, for sovereignty, for freedom, for liberation. Um, and I wondered if there were ways that Latinx Jewish folks um, like intentionally retained or displayed certain identity markers so that mm. those intersecting identities wouldn't have to always be declared or explained, um, but just very subtly being able mm. to present oneself, right, as both Jewish, as both Latinx um, in a very simple but direct way yeah. um, so that it, you know, becomes a shortcut to, you know, having to answer the question like, oh, I, I thought you were Jewish, but, you know, right. uh, I thought you were right, Latinx. Right. Um, but I've, I found that with um, the folks that I've worked with and kind of explore my research around Black Muslim identity, um, that there were very sort of specific and intentional ways um, that they were able to say, well, this is how I incorporate a symbol um, that serves mm -hmm. as a way to kind of translate all of this. So sure. um, when folks ask, right, I can kind of point to that or they see it and I don't have to explain. Yeah, yeah. that's a fascinating question. And I, I, um, I it's, it's so interesting. And I would say that what happens for particularly among Jews is that, uh, you, you know, I, I'm not sure that they, I think one of the ways and this happened among my respondents is ways to signal that they're Jewish, right? Not necessarily that they're, you know, I think for many of them, it's obvious that they're Latinx because they all, they, they, I would say they all had, uh, I, I interviewed 85 people, 83 of them were in Spanish the, of the interviews. Um, so only two people chose to interview in English. Um, nonetheless, I know the majority of them have accents, some heavier than others. Um, but I think that in many ways, people did try to drop, sort of mention that they, uh, some of it happened, you know, some of, one of, some of the things that, th that were said to me, and this is perhaps not something that they can control, but they'd say, oh, you know, I, I have this, you know, I, I have an accent and, 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 but I have this Jewish last name. So people kind of know, or, um, I can, you know, I sometimes I'll say, oh, I'm, I'm taking tomorrow off because it's a holiday. And in some ways they, they, they want people to know because then they'll say, oh, look, now, oh, it's a holiday. Oh, we all know that it's Rosh Hashanah, for, for example, right? So, um, and and in many ways it's, it's, and this is what begins to sort of foment this ethnic capital, right? This idea that, oh, well, in this way, I'm part of your group, right? We have, we have this in common, I'm part of an insider group. Um, and I think in that sense they do for sure. Um, and it's, I, I think it's in part, some of the things that happen oftentimes is that people might talk about where they went to school, um, right? So then you know, because somebody says where they went to school in um, among Mexicans, perhaps it's where they, where they lived. Um, so, and, and, it, and I think this is, I have, you know, I, I, I have not thought about this uh, about what you, about, about this idea in so theoretically, but I think it's so important because absolutely people do this, but um, but in different ways, right? In very subtle ways. Um, yeah, so interesting. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, we're gonna take you off the hot seat, Dr. Limonik. Uh, thank you so much for your work on this and uh, and for sharing your thoughts with us tonight. I'm gonna turn the the dais uh, microphone over to Reverend Lisa Zook.
Thank you, Rachel. And thank you very much, Dr. Limonique, for a wonderful lecture. If we can all just take a moment to do some virtual uh, signs of affirmation and appreciation. Um, that was fascinating. And as you can see with this diverse community that uh, you're gathered with tonight, um, we all spend a lot of time thinking about these things. So thank you for helping us to just use this particular way in to really tease apart um, how it is that we come to be who we are so that if we understand that better, maybe we can better understand how we come together. Um, so we really thank you very much. Um, and I'm very glad that we've been introduced to you and I hope that you will remain a friend to CTS. And, um, and someday when you're in Chicago, we'll see one another in person and won't that be lovely. Um, yeah, well, friends, my name is Lisa Zook and I serve as the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives. And as part of my role, I help to direct our Interreligious Institute or what we call the IRI. Since its inception in 2017, the IRI has awarded the Shulman Interreligious Leadership Award annually. Named for Rabbi Herman E. Shulman, this award supports and recognizes a CTS student for an interreligious project. A child of the Shoah, Rabbi Shulman was born in Munich, Germany in 1916. He was able to escape Nazi Germany by enrolling in Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati in 1935. He spent much of his career as senior rabbi of Emanuel Congregation here in Chicago, serving in that role for more than 30 years. And during his time in Chicago, he met Dr. Andre Lecoq and the two developed a deep and abiding friendship. Dr. Lecoq, in fact, introduced Rabbi Shalman to CTS and our community was blessed by his teaching and his friendship and his support over many years. Rabbi Shalman is widely known for his commitments to interreligious activism and to a firm belief that interreligious friendships can improve and heal the world. The Shalman Interreligious Leadership Award established in his honor and memory is intended to advance interreligious understanding, engagement, and leadership. Each year, CTS students are invited to submit an essay and a proposal for an interreligious project. The Shalman awardee receives a $500 cash prize and a $500 microgrant to help implement their project. I'm excited to share with you that the 2022 Rabbi Herman E. Shalman Interreligious Leadership Award goes to Leo Walters Tahera. Unfortunately, Leo can't join us tonight, but I'd like to share a little bit about Leo and their project. Leo is a second year Masters of Religious Studies major with a concentration in interreligious studies, and they currently live in the town of Olean, a small rural town in Southwest New York State. Recently, Leo's town has seen offensive rhetoric targeting multiple marginalized communities and seeking to sow discord and increase division. Leo's project proposes an interfaith, interideological lawn sign campaign in their town that would play on current community awareness and build intersectionality. They plan to purchase and distribute 500 lawn signs bearing the words, there is no them, only us. They will distribute these to local community members, businesses, religious communities, and organizations that agree to participate. In tandem with this, Leo will launch an op-ed campaign in Olean's local and regional newspapers. This campaign will contain writings from each sector that was targeted, again, helping to reinforce, reinforce the idea of interdep interdependence. The committee that selected Leo as this year's Shaman awardee is very excited about this creative endeavor, and we look forward to following their project and hearing about the impact of the campaign. Leo, I know you're sorry that you weren't able to be with us this evening, but I do know that you'll be watching this recording later. So on behalf of the entire CTS community, I want to offer you our sincere congratulations. And Chad, I'll turn it now to you. 
Thank you, Lisa. What always excites me about lectures like these is that I can look around the room, or in this case, the screen, and I can see dozens of other folks who I have worked with off and on over the last year. What's more, I can look around and I can see a group of people who are interested in this work of interfaith collaboration, physical people who are curious to learn, who want to be involved, and you are the folks who want to see this sort of work continue. My excitement and my hope for this type of work grows when I hear that my advancement team tells me that we have reached 96% of our modest $5,000 fundraising goal for this event. I'm placing a link in the chat right now so that you can check it out. And we have gotten this far as of tonight because, CT because of people like CTS trustees Mark Winters and our board chair, Brian Clark, who have been actively sharing this campaign with their friends in their network. It's because people like you here in the Zoom call who gave when you registered, because you know making a gift of even 10 or $20 is important to this work. And it's supported, and we've got this far because of others have responded to our emails, to our letters, asking you to give to this important work. So thank you. Thank you. And I find tonight particularly important, this lecture. Throughout the program, we got to learn a bit about our history, our presence, and our future of interfaith work at CTS. The rich legacy beginning in the early days with Professor Andre Lecoq and his friend, Rabbi Herman Shalman, culminating at the time with the establishing of the Shalman Chair for Jewish Studies, where our very own Professor Rabbi Rachel Mikva sits, and then moving into the creation of JCIS, and later the Interreligious Institute at CTS, and now this beautiful partnership with Bayon. And yet again now, we have this invitation to work closer with Professor Rashad and continue her work at CTS, thanks to the generosity of the Warich family and the ongoing work of our trustees. Clearly, I have glossed over countless benchmarks, milestones. I have missed key happenings in this work, but I think you get the point. CTS has been doing this work with our community for over 40 years. We have grown and involved. We have listened with ears of compassion and our understanding has deepened. And we've only been able to do this work because of the support of people like you. I want to thank all of you who have been with us on this journey. I'm grateful for those of you who are just joining us as part of this legacy. And I invite you all to consider supporting this important work at CTS as we step into this future together. If you feel so moved to support this work, please visit the link in the chat and give and give generously. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chad. Um, uh, just want to say uh, this has been this has been a wonderful inaugural uh, Lacoque uh, lecture here, and of course we want to uh, celebrate that um, and continue to celebrate our Shaman Award awardee, and of course uh, celebrate Dr. Rashad's uh, continuing presence in our midst, and of course uh, Dr. Laura Limonique's presentation uh, took us somewhere else. I would like to end with a brief. Uh, maybe somewhat personal reflection um, as a way of closing our time together. Uh, the, uh, as I argued in that class that I wish uh, Kugel and Frijoles was assigned, I, I said that one of the defining markers of the Latinx identity is the constant negotiation of identity. That the negotiating of identity to be sure is a promise. It's an invitation for creativity. And dare I say, it's a caris, a gift. It's a charismatic process. And yet the negotiation of identity, as Dr. Limonique's work demonstrates, sadly, is also a burden, a crisis, and truly a tragedy. If I could use a metaphor, um, these intersecting identities, intersectionality, a term we use so well, is definitely uh, can be seen as knitting needles, handling knitting needles to web this identity. And yet sometimes those knitting needles feels more like scalpels. They cut and we bleed. 
Yeah, this negotiation of identity is truly a tragedy at times. Now, one would hope that, say, our religious, uh, our religious traditions might provide succor or uh, recourse or maybe relief. But religious identity, like ethnic identity, stands between promise and burden, between creativity and crisis, between the charismatic and the tragic. Philosopher Miguel de Unamuno said uh, in his book, Tragic Sense of Life, that says he, we lie to ourselves if we think that we live epic to epic, success to success. He instead argued that we live tragedy to tragedy because with every decision, something dies. Something dies. And maybe the only way forward, like the wounded caring for the wounded, is to find ways in which the religious and the ethnic might be intentionally correlated in mutually critical and mutually edifying ways. Maybe as the wounded caring for the wounded. The most hopeful witnesses I read in Dr. Limonit's book found a way to do just that. However messy, whether wielding knitting needles or scalpels, they found a way to mutually correlate their identities. Always a little tragedy, but also a little joy. Now, for those of us who might at least pretend like our identities are fixed, what might be your role in all this? Well, here I argue from a Latinx theologian, Roberto Gorsueta's notion of acompañamiento, accompaniment. And again, Dr. Limonique's work shows the ways in which Latinx Jews choose acompañamiento as a accompaniment, as a way in which to wield those needing needles, to weave together a new identity in the hope that in this acompañamiento, and this is our call, CTS, this is our call guest, this is our charge as we leave, that we might take up the call of acompañamiento in hopes that those of us who wield uh, needing needles turn scalpels, that those of us might find this negotiation identity, negotiation of identity slightly less burden and a little bit more promise, uh, a little less crisis and a little more creative endeavor, slightly less tragic and a little more charismatic. The hope is that as we accompany each other, we start to see less and less scalpels and more and more knitting needles. Again, I wanna thank Dr. Laura Limonique for her amazing uh, presentation and thank you all for being here. Thank you, blessings. Gracias, Laura. Gracias, this was wonderful, thank you. And that was a beautiful closing statement. So I was just Gracias. writing that in the chat, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And what a beautiful community, so thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, everyone. Good, <laughs> thank you. Good night. Thank you, thanks very much.